Hi, welcome to tonight's show, Geology Forum. My name is Patricia Brady. We have a very interesting show tonight. It's a topic about uh, Yellowstone, and um, it's the geology of uh, Yellowstone National Parks and Southwest Montana volcanoes and the landscape. And I have a special guest tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. William J. Fritz. He's the Senior Vice President and Provost for the College of Staten Island. Dr. Fritz is also a geologist who has done extensive research on ancient volcanoes. Among his long list of scholarly accomplishments, he has authored Roadside Geology of Yellowstone Country. He is also um, a member of the CUNY doctoral fac faculty, and uh, he enjoys teaching uh, geology, and again, his uh, topic is the geology of Yellowstone Park in southwest Montana, volcanoes and landscapes. So I would like to welcome Dr. Fritz tonight, and um, Dr. Fritz, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm real pleased to be here this evening. Okay. Um, we'll get back to you in a second. Right. <laughs> Just want to introduce Dr. Alan Benamoff from the College of Staten Island. Um, Dr. Benamoff teaches at the College of Staten Island um, all the geology classes and environmental. So I'm going to just swing back for a second. And I, now, Dr. Fritz, you're vice president, senior vice president, and a provost. What is a provost? I don't know what that is. Well, that's a real good question, Pat. And first, just let me say to the audience, I'm really pleased to be here this evening at the College of Staten Island. We very much value being part of the Staten Island community, and I think being here on, on community TV this uh, evening is a very, is a very great, great honor. So to, to answer your question, as senior vice president, I really assist our president, Dr. Tomas uh, Morales, in, in the operation of the college and, and again one of the things that we're trying to do is, is to forge community partnerships to provide a quality uh, education uh, for the the residents of, of the College of Staten Island. Uh, I do have a hold of a, a title as is common in most institutions in higher education. The provost is the chief academic officer and as such really oversees all of the academic programs and, and the type of academic programs that we offer. Oh, you've explained it well. <laughs> I thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Benamorf, would you like to say a few opening words before we start the program? Well, I think it's great that, that we have Dr. Fr Fritz here. He's, a, he's, he's an expert on the, on the Yellowstone area, and, and we're grateful for him to be on the show here and tell p people of Staten Island about that particular area. Okay, that is west. We're, we're heading west right now. So, okay, Dr. Fritz, would you like to uh, start the PowerPoint? Yes, and, and again, let me say it's a great honor okay. to be here. I was, I was on Dr. Benamoff's field trip of the oh, geology yes. of Staten Island mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, but uh, what I'm here to talk about this evening is uh, an area that's far away from Staten Island, but, but uh, many of you may have the opportunity to have either visited in Yellowstone or visit there uh, during your summer vacation, and this is just to try to give you some interesting things to look at while you're on vacation. Sounds good. So we're go going to get started right now. And we're going to, Mike, if you can lower the lights, please. And we will start the PowerPoint. Okay, first let me say that uh, the things that I'm talking about this evening are really have been my whole career in working on the geology of the West, trying to understand how volcanoes influence the landscape. And I have many, many graduate students, undergraduate students, fellow researchers, as in any project in science, it's rarely a single effort. Many hundreds of people have, uh, have really helped in the project. So when most people think of Yellowstone, uh, you know, as again you can see from the, from the cover of the book, they think of Old Faithful, the geysers, the hot springs. Mm -hmm. Old Faithful Geyser is the, really the result of boiling water, very, very hot, superheated water that's just a few hundreds of feet or a few thousand feet below the landscape. And it's really the, the result of the volcano that's there, the heat from the, from the volcanic rocks. Uh, when you're standing in Yellowstone Park, there's still partially molten rock, maybe less than a mile uh, underneath your feet. 
and as rainwater seeps down, it becomes heated, and that boiling water coming to the surface makes all of the spectacular features that, that draw uh, literally millions of people a year to Yellowstone Park. One way to think of Yellowstone, we really live on an active geologic uh, planet uh, because of the radioactivity within the Earth. The Earth is still very hot in the interior, and it, as it's hot, the lighter elements come to the surface. We can almost think of it as scum on a, on a, on a pot of uh, the boiling uh, stew or liquid where the lighter things come to the surface, and we have the continents. And these continents move throughout time, the theory of plate tectonics. And you can see these continents are broken. Here is the, the African plate, the North American plate, the South American plate. The yellow on this map are earthquakes, and the red are volcanoes. And most volcanoes and earthquakes occur along these plate boundaries where the upper layers of the earth are cracked and broken. And as these plates break apart, as they come together to form mountain belts, which if you look here, they, the breaking occurs in what's called a triple junction. If you can see how many of these plate boundaries really have three arms that are radiating out, you can see this in a number of different areas. If you look in East Africa, you can see here the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, and then coming down into the East African rift system with several hot spots or volcanic centers is shown by the triangle. So Saudi Arabia has just recently separated from the African continent, and East Africa along this East African rift system is in the process of separating from Africa. We have something very similar going on in North America which is the Yellowstone hotspot. Here in the center or far inland in the North American continent is where Yellowstone Park, the volcanic activity. And so I really want to focus on how volcanism, how the active plate tectonics have really profoundly influenced the Rocky Mountains and the spectacular scenery that you see when you visit the West. This is a computer model that's been generated of what things might look like in the interior of the Earth. This would be the core, and the mantle would be the upper, the upper parts here. Uh, many scientists believe that there are what are called hot spots, areas of high heat flow that are radiating and rising from the core. All of the radioactivity, the Earth is, is driven by a radioactive heat engine, and as the molten material rises to the surface, this would produce a hot spot, and you might expect a center of volcanic activity to be the surface expression of that hot spot. The Yellowstone hot spot has really had a profound impact in Western North America. Uh, this is a drawing, a very recent uh, article published by Professor Jim Sears at the University of Montana and he thinks that this large ellipse that goes all the way from British Columbia, northern Washington State, clear down into southern California and really the, the southwest is the surface expression of this Yellowstone hotspot area. Now continents move and so over time it appears that the actual center of volcanic activity has moved. So about 17 million years ago, where this red X is, is where the Yellowstone hotspot started. So there would have been something 17 million years ago that looked like modern Yellowstone, clear back here, many thousands or, or hundreds of miles to the west of where it is today. As the hotspot has moved, the centers of volcanic activity have gotten younger and younger and younger and younger and younger, and Yellowstone is right about the tip of the red arrow today. And as the result of that hot material rising to the surface, the <coughs> highest mountains in the continental U.S. are right here in this area. Some of the highest landscape is right here centered around Yellowstone Park. You can see the dark brown is the hot. The darker the brown, the higher the landscape.
Uh, can you tell me what state that is right now that you're well, let's talking look, about? Well, let's look. This is the same diagram over here with the state boundaries that mm -hmm. are shown. So these two are at about the same scale. This is just showing the, the state boundaries. So Yellowstone today is this circular area right here, which would be extreme northwestern Wyoming, just a little bit of southern Montana, and a little sliver of Idaho within Yellowstone National Park. Okay. The other way to look at it, you can either think of the hot spot moving underneath the North American continent, but what's really happening is the hot spot is staying in one place and the continent moves over the hot spot. So if you see these arrows in the second diagram, it's showing that the continent is sliding over the hot spot. You can either think of it as the hot spot moving, but really what's happening is the hot spot is staying stable and the, and the continent is doing So our continent is moving westward. Yes, the continent is moved, the, the North America's continent is moving westward large as the result of the spreading center that is going out in the middle of the Atlantic, about halfway between North America and Europe, which is pushing the North American continent westward. Well, this is some of the spectacular scenery that you find in southwestern Montana, several hundred miles north of modern-day Yellowstone. And really, my interest in this started clear back when I was in graduate school. And at the time, my major professor was a vertebrate paleontologist, meaning that he studied small little shrew-sized animals. He, his specialty was fossil shrews, uh, the ones that are oligocene in age, maybe 30 to 40 million years old. And so this is just a drawing of the skulls of some of those fossil shrews that you find in rocks in these basins. Now these animals are so tiny, they don't move very far. They, 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 during their entire life span, they only may live a few yards from, from where they were born and where they grew up. And so usually each modern basin has a different species of shrew in it. But if you go to the fossil record, each of these basins in Montana, the uh, shrews were all of the same species. And so no one could understand how these little shrews could sort of climb up over these mountain ranges and get to the other side. Another enigma was is that if you go to the highest peaks of the mountain ranges, if you see this very flat surface here at the top of that mountain, that's a lava flow. It's a basalt lava flow that came from Yellowstone Park. That lava would have had to flow you know, up over several different mountains to get to where it is today, or maybe the mountain wasn't there. Something that uh, back when I was in graduate school, the theory of plate tectonics was just getting started, and no one really understood the great impact that the Yellowstone hotspot has had on creating these basins and ranges. Again, this is the Grand Tetons just south of Yellowstone. Again, most people that go to Yellowstone will go to Jackson Hole, and, and you know, here's the Grand, the Grand Teton. Well, these are very, very young ranges because there are ash flows and lava flows from the Yellowstone regions that, that, that originated on the other side of the mountains that you find on this side of the mountains. Geologists now think this entire mountain range may be less than several, maybe less than a million, less than a million and a half years old. And so if you go back in very recent geologic time, this area would have been a flat plain until this hot spot came by. And so I'll tell, talk a little bit more of the details of how these <coughs> ranges formed. Now, is there any evidence it's still rising, or is it uh, sort of subsided? Uh... Yes, that's a great lead-in to, to this slide that I'm showing here. This is just a little bit more detail. The darker the color, the higher the landscape. So this blue color here is really a valley. This is the, the we call it the Snake River Plain, but it would be maybe analogous to some of the East African rift basins. This is a map here by Ken Pierce and Lisa Morgan of the U.S. Geological Survey, and they have compiled a number of the features that we find of the region. So remember, you know, 13 years ago Yellowstone was here, then 12 million years ago here, and here, about 10 million years ago it was here, and then for the last 2 million it's been right up here in, in this particular region. 
Notice how the land is much higher around Yellowstone. That's because that area is being inflated. It's actually uplifted today. Some people have made the analogy that as this hot spot plows through the mountains, it's really like the bow wave on a boat. If you've ever st stood at the very bow of a, of a motorboat and looked at the, at the compression wave in front of the boat, this would be the compression wave in front of Yellowstone. And sure enough, if you look at earthquakes in the Rocky Mountain region, those earthquakes really follow that uplift, because you can imagine the, the shaking and the earthquakes that would be generated. Then, as the hot spot goes by, the rocks start to cool. And as they cool, it's really not so much as the mountain range being pushed up, but the basin drops down. So it's much more of the whole area being inflated, and then the valley drops down. So rather than the Tetons being pushed up, the valley in front of Jackson Hole is dropped down to adjust to a new level. The Northern Rockies have really had a complex history to understand the ranges that occur in southwestern Montana and Yellowstone. You probably have to go clear back somewhere between 60 and 75 million years ago during the late Cretaceous. Maybe dinosaurs were even still around. And, and at the time, there was a collision between either small little microcontinents, things the size of Indonesia, that collided with Western North America. And that collision began the formation of the modern-day Rocky Mountains. We call that the severe orogeny and the Laramide orogeny. Really, they're the same event, but they're just different ways that rocks fold and, and deform when small continents collide. Following that, there was a period of volcanic activity in the Eocene 40 to 53 million years ago. And depending on where you are in the West, it's either called the Absorica Volcanic Supergroup, if you're in Yellowstone Park region, if you're in central Oregon, it's the Clarno. In Idaho, the Chalice. Or I'm going to talk quite a bit about the area around Dillon, Montana, the Dillon Volcanics. These would be like modern Mount St. Helens. If you, if you, if you mm -hmm. have, uh, remember back in 1980 when Mount St. Helens erupted just north of Portland, Oregon, and produced uh, not only a lot of ash flows, but debris flows and mud flows. And that would be the type of volcanism that was occurring back here 40 to 53 million years ago. Then there was a period, we call it the Renova Formation. That's when all those little shrews were living that my major professor, Bob Fields, uh, uh, studied. And they're, they're, they're a very rich fossil deposits. Much of what we know of the evolution of, uh, of mammals uh, throughout that come from, from tertiary age uh, rocks. And the Renova Formation has a, has a rich history. Then something happened, and rather then the kind of volcanism you get when one plate slides underneath another, we got a transition to something like the rift basins in East Africa. Rather than the continent being pushed together, something was trying to stretch the continent apart. And when continents are stretched apart, the chemistry of the rock is very, very different. It's much richer in, in iron and magnesium and, and elements that are coming from much deeper in the earth then we have a period of time when we really started to get major influence from the Yellowstone hotspot. That's the recent faulting, the downdropping of the basins. There's a gravel deposit called the Six Mile Creek Formation that I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. And then, of course, the modern landscape that you see when you visit Yellowstone has really been a sculpting by glacial ice that carve the exact scenery that you see today. Let's focus in a little bit. Here's Wyoming. Again, modern Yellowstone. And this is the period of volcanism that's not the recent geysers and hot springs that you see, but it's that older 50 million year old volcanic activity. The Absorica Volcanic Supergroup here, Chalice Volcanic Rocks in central Idaho. 
And what I want to focus on is what was going on, since this is the, the roadside geology of Yellowstone, we really want to focus on what was going on in Yellowstone during that time. This would be out that basin that all of the small little mammals were living in with no ranges, just probably a broad, flat, open plain. So in Yellowstone Park 50 million years ago, there were chains of volcanoes that might have been like Mount St. Helens or the modern Cascades range, Mount Hood, Mount Shasta, Mount Baker, some of the uh, spectacular volcanoes along the west coast of North America. And there would have been a basin between the two, so you can imagine these volcanoes erupting and mudslides and debris flows come rushing down the side of the volcano. And when they did that, you really see some spectacular things preserved in these mud flows. And I just want to show you a few of these. Uh, some of the stream gravels, conglomerate. There must have been little lakes with fine-grained lake sediments and shales in them. But what tourists like, the many tourists going to Yellowstone don't realize, and I think these features are as neat as any of the geysers and hot springs, are all of the petrified trees that are buried in the debris flows. When Mount St. Helens erupted, the debris flows carried along large numbers of logs and stumps in the mud, buried the trees, and then the silica in the volcanic rocks actually preserve the trees. So, so here are three large, this, this is a petrified redwood here, very almost indistinguishable from the modern day coast redwood, except these rock, these are about 48 million years old. So this tree here is 12 feet in diameter, and these are three and four feet in diameter, and you can see they're standing, they're harder than the rock that they're buried in, so they stand tall. Uh, here's, here's the an example of a stump, you can actually see the texture of the bark on the stump is, is preserved and fossilized. Here is a log, you can see the roots splaying out, and there's, there's a log right there. In mm -hmm. the, and, and there are literally, if you hike into the back country of Yellowstone, there, there are just probably tens of thousands of these petrified trees in the Yellowstone petrified forests. You know, here's some more example. This one is actually just outside of Yellowstone. It's 12 or 13 feet in diameter. Uh, if you go to Yellowstone, you can see the one petrified tree that has a cage around it. I have a picture that was taken in 1878, and it didn't have the cage around it, but there was also five or six other trees that collectors carried off before the park was protected. The trees are just amazingly preserved. You see that you can see this is looking down on a little pine stump, and you can see the growth rings in it. If you didn't know, you'd think it was just a modern piece of wood, but it's about 48 million years old. Mm. You can cut a thin section and look through a microscope, and the cell structure is all preserved. <coughs> you know, here you can see where the tree was growing s either slower or not at all in the winter, and then it grows very fast in the spring mm -hmm. and producing the growth rings. Uh, there's also fossilized pollen. These uh, pollen grains, uh, courtesy of uh, Dr. Uh, Lanny Fisk, who, who worked on the palynology of Yellowstone. These are some fossil pine pollen, and probably the kind of thing that's uh, stuffing up everybody's nose on Staten Island. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, I think I have the, some. <laughs> this time of year. But uh, the, you can really get a good study of the ecology of what the, the area was like. These are... These are all scenes from the northern part of Yellowstone Park that uh, contain these petrified. You can see any of these scenes driving the roads in the northern part of Yellowstone. Okay, so that's just part of the story. That was the story of what was going on 40 to 50 million years ago. What we want to switch forward in time and maybe a little further from Yellowstone and really look at how Yellowstone impacted the landscape. This is the, the Renova formation that those little fossil mammals are preserved in. Mm -hmm. But it's this upper Six Mile Creek formation that's made of stream gravels. And the neat thing about stream gravels, do you see how these gravels are all kind of shingled, inclined back to the left? The water in the, in the stream that carried those would have been flowing from left to right. 
If it had flowed the other way, it would have flipped the stones back over. So it's useful to tell what direction the streams were running. What's also interesting in this kind of science, and you don't need to read all these numbers, we had to do hundreds and hundreds of radiometric dates to actually date the ages of the lava flows to try to understand the evolution. So again, we had rocks. This would be a, a cartoon through North America. Here's Yellowstone over here in this region. You know, this would be the, the margin of the continent along the Pacific Ocean. And, and back here 40 to 50 million years ago, this descending plate was melting, and as, as it melted, the blobs rose to the surface, and that's what made the, the volcanoes that preserved the petrified trees. At some point in time, we switched to an area that the continent was being stretched apart. And so the magma started coming from much deeper, and so its chemistry was different. And that's what this chart over here shows. You can look at the chemistry of, of rocks, how much silica they have in them, the sodium and the potassium, and tell something about the kind of environment in which they formed. So these would be some of the volcanic rocks out in, the, out in the, some of the lava flows from about 40 million years ago that are out in the basins, again, a couple of hundred miles north of Yellowstone. And I'm just going to skip through a few of these. What, what we're most interested in at this part of the story, then, is when does this Yellowstone hotspot first start changing the nature of the landscape? When did it change the North American continent from being these big, broad, open valleys to the modern basins and ranges that we find today? And so you can look at it by the big, explosive volcanoes, because the Yellowstone hotspot, modern Yellowstone, the volcanic center is 47 miles across. And, uh, you know, compared to Mount St. Helens, whose crater is less than a mile across. So these would be huge, almost unimaginably large volcanic eruptions, where a single eruption might put out a layer of, of this white ash. So you can see this, there's a person for scale, so this might be 15 or 20 foot high cliff is a single flow of ash material from a volcanic eruption maybe 100 miles, 150 miles away from when the volcano was. And so we can trace when those volcanoes first started to erupt. So again, the story that I was talking about, remember I at the beginning said, how did the basalt get over the mountain or how did the little shrews get over the mountain? Mm -hmm. The real answer is those mountains weren't there a few million years ago. The lava would have flowed across. Lava is liquid and like water. Water flows downhill and across flat surfaces. So you can see this flat surface here really connects up with this flat surface here, and there's a major fault. Remember I talked about the basins dropping down as the hot spot cools. This is a little cartoon here showing the fault with one side of the rocks going down and the other side of the rocks going up. So basically you have an, what's called a normal fault, right? Uh, yes, this would be a normal fault because the rocks to the left of that arrow are going down in relationship to the rocks here which are going up. In the Yellowstone area, I like to think of it more of, of the whole area having been lifted high and then it's the, you know, gravity likes to pull things down so it's easier to drop a valley down than it is to push a mountain up even though it's some, it's sometimes it's easy to think of the, the mountain growing, it's really the valley that's growing. And because there's only one fault, notice this side of the valley doesn't have a fault. And so normal fault-bounded valleys are called grobbins, and this is a half grobbin because you only see half of, there's only a fault on one side of the basin. So let's look a little closer at how Yellowstone works today. So this is a picture in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. It's one of the, the favorite spots that tourists like to come and take pictures because you can imagine as hot water works through rock, it dissolves everything. And, and you know, when the water is several hundred degrees centigrade, three or four hundred degrees, it just, it just dissolves everything. And it dissolves everything except iron. 
and all of the red and you, the yellow colors are probably sulfur and, and iron rich where where iron and aluminum are not very soluble and so all of the soluble things get uh, wet brought away. So here's the river down at the bottom of the canyon and it's just exposed all of these rocks that the hot steam has come up through to make the geyser. So again, just to, to, to remind you of the story of what we're looking at, this was some 14 to 17 million years ago. Yellowstone hot spot was here and that it's moved along the Snake River Plain until the X is where it is today. As it's moved along, the, the land inflated, and then after it went by, it dropped down again. And so these dark lines here are the faults that, wherever you see one of those faults, there would be a range, a mountain range. Are there underground rivers also? Like, how does the steam come up? It, it, just like any groundwater, most rock we think of as being really solid, but if you take a, a sandstone that's made up of small grains of sand, probably 30% of a rock are hollow spaces mm -hmm. and void spaces, and so the, just like any groundwater, the rock just moves, or the, the steam moves through the spaces in the rock. It's just that instead of being cold, like we think of as most groundwater, this is really boiling waters, and so it's the steam and the hot water that's coming up through it. I think I'm going to skip on here so we can, I'm going to skip a couple slides because I really want to, I really want to be sure that we have time to talk about how the volcanic center works in Yellowstone. So let's focus in on modern Yellowstone. So this is, these are the boundaries of Yellowstone National Park. Here's a scale down here that's 50 miles. So Yellowstone is, well, Yellowstone itself is larger than many states. Sometimes tourists and first-time visitors to Yellowstone forget that and think they can drive across the park in a single day, but it, it really, to thoroughly see Yellowstone takes several days, if not weeks, to really thoroughly explore. There's, I think there's, there's about, there's several hundred miles of roads in the park, and there's probably three times that in terms of the number of hiking trails. So to really experience Yellowstone, you want to get out, get your backpack, spend, spend a few days or a few weeks uh, hiking in the backcountry. But Yellowstone is a very, very uh, large area. These yellow lines are the boundaries of what's called a caldera. And a caldera you could think of as a really big crater from a volcano, a crater being the, the open hollow space in the, in, in the, in the center of the, of the volcano. So these are called calderas because they're so large. So in the last two million years, Yellowstone has erupted three times in about the same place. Does that mean that the hot spot is slowed down or did all of them erupt that many times in the same place? We really don't know at this point. But two million years ago, the volcanic caldera was 80, more than 80 miles in diameter. Imagine a volcano where the crater is 80 miles across. You know, Staten Island is what, 15, 16 miles long? Yeah, yeah. About, that. So about that. So this would be, you know, Staten Island would be just a tiny blip in the, in the center of that. So we're talking about huge, huge volcanic areas. So it erupted about just a little over 2 million years ago. Then it erupted again at about 1.2 million years ago, and that's this little caldera here. And when I say little, you know, that thing's still 20 miles across. And then it had another major eruption 600,000 years ago, and that's this one. And it's the activity from the 600,000 year eruption that's still cooling, and that's what's making the geysers and the hot springs and the, and, and the material that's there. Uh, these darker colored rocks are, the, are those ash flows, kind of like that white one that I showed you earlier where the ash clouds flowed many tens to many hundreds of miles away from the volcano. 
In addition, there would have been a plume of ash that probably went, you know, many, many thousands of feet up into the upper atmosphere. And you can find deposits of the Yellowstone eruptions clear out in, in drill core in the Gulf of uh, Mexico. So this would be something that would be, you know, profoundly affect worldwide climate, you know, condi conditions uh, worldwide. When, when Mount St. Helens erupted, a tiny little eruption compared to Yellowstone, there was actually ash fallout, that, an ash cloud that circled the globe. There, were, there was a dusting of ash clear as far east as New England from the Mount St. Helens eruption. So, so can you, we imagine what would come out of what came this, out of here? That th this would be a whole different, a whole different scale. Yeah. Now I see you have uh, co contrasting rock types. You have the rhyolite and the basalt. Yes, the rhyolite here, which is which is the gray color, is, are the actual lava flows, and that's where the lava comes to the surface and it flows out. Now, rhyolite lava is really pasty. It's not like the lava that comes out of the Hawaiian volcanoes, which is real fluid and flows for many, many miles. Rhyolite lava would be like bread dough or toothpaste. It doesn't like to flow anywhere. And so some of these flows get up to 1,000 feet thick before this pasty lava would actually move anywhere. So the lava really doesn't flow for long distances. So it's very vi viscous. It's, it's viscous extremely type. viscous, very high. It's a high silica. It has a high silica content. And the higher the silica, the more viscous and pasty the lava gets. Is there any evidence of volcanic glasses in this area? Like oh, yes. Ma many of these lava flows, there's obsidian cliffs right here at about this part. And, and obsidian is where the lava cools so quickly it forms a natural glass. Really artificial glass is if you just take sand and melt it in, 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 a, in a laboratory or a, or a factory, and then when it cools quickly it forms glass. The same thing can happen from the volcano. If, if, if it's either very dry magma, meaning not very much water in it, or if it cools quickly. And, and the early Native Americans really knew about this because this is some of the highest grade glass found anywhere in North America. And you can find the, the, the early Native American tribes prized this for making spear points and arrowheads. And you can find pieces of obsidian, Yellowstone volcanic glass clear into the, uh, the mound builders in the, in the eastern part, the south and eastern part of North America that were trading for that material because it was so prized. But what really happens is a lot of this rhyolite lava has a lot of water dissolved in it. And when the water is many tens of miles underground, the high pressure keeps it from boiling. But when it gets to the surface, the water is 700 degrees centigrade. And water boils at about 100 degrees centigrade. And so when the pressure is released, that water flashes to steam. And, and the flashing of steam, it's just like a boiler explosion. It's really the same process of, as a boiler explosion, where the water flashing to steam shreds the rock apart into tiny, tiny little particles called glass. So volcanic glass is where this ex tremendous explosion shreds the rock, and then those particles flow as an ash cloud. And that's this color rock that you can find remnants of many, many miles away from the volcano. Okay, I'd just like to break in for, for a minute. Um, we're going to be putting up a, an email, and if anybody has a question for Dr. Fritz or Dr. Benamoff about Yellowstone, give, uh, give us an email and maybe... You can repeat the email address if you want. Oh, uh, yes. Um, and, they'll and, be putting it and up. And we also have it on the screen. Oh, yes. Geoforum at ymail.com. Uh, we have the computers here, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to answer your questions. Okay. Okay. Well, let's look a little more at, at, at the details of how that system might work. Remember, these happen in cycles. People speculate because the, in the same location, Yellowstone has erupted three times about every 600,000 years. So it erupted a little over 2 million years ago, 1.2 million, 600,000. 
It's been about 600,000 years since the last eruption. But any one of these eruptions, here's the magma from deep down that's pushing towards the surface. So the magma pushes towards the surface. The whole area inflates, rises up. That's that dark brown, the high area around Yellowstone because of the magma pushing to the surface. Eventually, the magma gets so close to the surface that it flashes to steam. And when it flashes to steam, you can see here the steam is driving out all of the rock that's been broken and shattered into tiny, tiny sand grain sized particles called volcanic ash. And so here's, here's the clouds of volcanic ash that are coming up out of that caldera. This caldera, remember, might be anywhere from 40 to 80 miles across. The ash probably comes out around the edges, the, the margins of the, sometimes we think of it as ring fractures because they're really circular uh, if you were looking at a helicopter looking straight down. So there's some volume of rock and, and the volume of rock from a single eruption in Yellowstone is really hard to believe. It almost defies the imagination but hundreds of cubic miles. So a cubic mile would be a piece of rock a mile wide, a mile deep, and a mile high. And there would be hundreds of miles of rock shattered in this eruption that would come out in these ash clouds. Well, of course, now we have a hollow down here, and, and that's gravity is going to just drop the blocks back down into that hollow. And that's what's called the caldera, the hollow that sometimes it's called a collapse caldera because it collapses back into the hollow. Following that is when the lava, the magma has now lost all of its steam, all of the volatiles are gone because they drove the eruption. And then that's when the lava flows come out. These would be the thick, thousand foot thick lava flows, some of which make a city in so that's a cycle. That cycle's happened at least, well, it's happened many tens of times as the Yellowstone hotspot has been in many different positions, but it's happened at least three times in its current location, about every 600,000 years. What, uh, I have a question. When is it predicted that it'll erupt again? Well, it's still a very active area. You can uh, measure the uplift. The, the magma still is pushing to the surface. Central Yellowstone kind of looks like it kind of stops and starts, but it's, it's pushing upward at several centimeters a year, about as fast as your fingernails grow. So, it, you know, it may not seem very fast, but geologically it's very, very fast as it's pushing to the surface. So Yellowstone is resurging again today. You know, does that mean it's really starting back, you know, from here? Are we coming full circle back to this stage again? It's certainly going to, you know, erupt at some point in the future. Plus or minus 100,000 years. I don't know. I would hate to make an, ex to predict. an exact prediction, but in terms of human life scale, it, it could well be a long, long time. In terms of geologic time, it's just a blink of an eye. It still is an active yeah. system. Do you think we would get much warning? Would it be earthquakes before? Or yeah, I think we would get a lot of... Uh, Warning, and, and, and in fact, uh, as we were talking before the show started, you can go to the U.S. Geological Survey site, www.usgs.gov, and really monitor the activity of, of volcanoes. And Yellowstone is one of the volcanoes that, that they show there. And the way scientists monitor volcanoes, as magma pushes towards the surface, you can imagine things starting to shake, just like this table might start shaking if something was pushing on it. That's an earthquake. An earthquake is nothing more than rocks naturally starting to shake. And so usually there are, there are many, Mount St. Helens, for example, before it erupted, a tiny little version of this, there were many months of lots of hundreds and thousands of small little earthquakes that signaled that the magma was rising. I, I'm assuming we'd have, that would also happen in Yellowstone. Sometimes the chemistry of the of the geysers and the hot springs would vary and, and scientists really study that chemistry because as you get slight changes in chemistry it's a signal that the magma is rising. The, 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 the short answer is yes, I think there'd be a lot of warning that it was going into an active phase but, but again it's something that we really 
you know, no one has ever seen a volcano of this scale erupt before. Mm. Any, uh, so there's, any uh, people uh, I guess emailing? we can answer this. Uh, uh, just, do we have yeah. uh, an email? Yes, we do. Let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, uh, I guess Dr. Fritz could still keep talking, you know. Okay. Well, well while talking. you're uh, looking, look at this graph. This is a, a graph here. These are cubic miles, 100 cubic miles, 600 cubic miles. This big bar here says that when the first eruption of two million years ago, there were 600 cubic miles just in the, the rock that had been fractured into all of the ash. 600 cubic miles. Again, it's a, it, it's a size that almost defies the imagination. By comparison, when Mount St. Helens erupted, it's a little blip you can't even see on the scale. We think of Mount St. Helens, or and Mount St. Helens was about the, the same size as Vesuvius that it erupted in AD 79 and destroyed Pompeii, you know, those would be way less than a cubic mile, maybe a, a eighth to a quarter cubic mile for an eruption like Mount St. Helens. These are the three Yellowstone eruptions here. You know, Krakatoa erupted in 1883. Look, you know, mild. Crops, crops failed in Western Europe because of the cold summers, because of all of the volcanic ash in the upper atmosphere. And you can see Krakatoa was maybe four cubic miles. Okay. Do you have, um, did someone email us? Yes, but I thought we'd, when Dr. Fritz is done, we could answer some of this. Well, the time is going by, so maybe we, we can, can just we take can a little break. We can any time. Okay. Let's put the lights back up. And if anybody from uh, the studio wants to ask a question. We have a microphone. We have a microphone set up. So if anybody has a question to ask uh, Dr. Fritz. Well, we uh, did get an email, and it said, uh, and the question is, is there any way to predict a volcanic eruption? Well, the predictions that we know about from the small, smaller volcanoes involve monitoring the earthquakes. Usually, earthquakes and volcanoes are two separate phenomena. Earthquakes occur where two plate boundaries move along in the two, like the San Andreas Fault, where Western California is moving northward in relationship to the rest of, and the grinding of those two plates cause a lot of shaking, earthquakes. But there's a special type of earthquake that occurs when magma pushes, or magma is liquid rock the molten, but if you melt rock, it makes magma. And as that magma rises up in the volcano, the whole volcano will shake. You know, maybe think like a bowl of jello or something that's, mm -hmm. that's shaking just a little bit. They're not, the, the earthquakes in and of themselves aren't at all damaging. They're so small, you would hardly feel them. But certainly the detection instruments around volcanoes can feel the shaking. And there's usually, they're called earthquake swarms, many thousands or hundreds of thousands of volcano or of earth, tiny earthquakes in it. And that's a signal that the magma is on the rise. That happened before the Mount St. Helens eruption. Uh, sometimes there's changes in the chemistry of the, of the gases coming out of the volcano. And so most modern volcanoes on, on the earth today, scientists are very carefully monitoring the chemistry of the gases for clues that the magma is getting close to the surface. Uh, the uplift that I talked about, Mount St. Helens, before it erupted, the north face was swelling at five feet a day. So again, That's if incredible. you measured the uplift in Yellowstone, <laughs> yeah. I'm saying is about as fast as your fingernails were growing. Mm -hmm. So if that uplift started increasing its rate, might be a signal that it was entering an active phase. So those would be the three kinds of things, earthquakes, yeah. The, the increase in the rate of uplift and the, the chemistry of the gases. Yeah. But, but again, it's one thing when, when people talk about prediction, they think of, well, is it going to erupt next Thursday at 3 o'clock? You know, I don't know, but in a geologic time over, over several hundred thousand years, Yellowstone will certainly erupt again. Yeah. Um, in the case of Mount St. Helens, uh, we were up there back a while ago, and. Um, they were claiming that the mountain blew out at 300 miles an hour? Does that sound... Uh... Yeah, the velocities are probably at least that high, if, if not higher. Mount St. Helens, uh, not only was there a large debris flow, but it, 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 the, the 
explosion directed a vertical blast. It's actually called a Plinian eruption column, named by Pliny the Younger, who, when, when Vesuvius erupted in AD 79, wrote the best eyewitness account of a volcanic, uh, that type of volcanic eruption until Mount St. Helens erupted in, in 1980. Okay, and so, so it would certainly be going at hundreds of miles an hour, at least in the initial Something also, you, you couldn't run away from. It. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, there, there was a U.S. Ge 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 geologist who they claim had 42 seconds to live. Yes, David they, David Johnson was was killed in the yeah. in the eruption. He was about three ridges uh, n north north of the the eruption, and uh, you know he had time to make a radio call before the actual ash cloud that was hugging uh, there got to him. For, yeah. Now, I also saw in your vita that uh, you did work in uh, South America on a, on a, vol on a, a, a volcanic mud flow that erupted yes. that, uh, in 1985. Yes, there, there was a small volcano that, well, actually a, a large volcano with a very small uh, eruption in 1985. And the volcano was called Nevada del Ruiz. And the eruption actually triggered the melting of, of some of the glacial ice that was on top of the volcano. That water rushed down the side of the volcano and the devastating floods and mudslows. There were some, at least 26,000 people were killed mm -hmm. because of the villages being in the path. In that case, it was a, a tiny eruption, but because of the, the water from the glacial ice on the volcano. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second. Um, we have uh, someone from the audience that has a question for Dr. Fritz. So um, we're just going to uh, center the cameras on them. Okay, we'll give it a second. We had the camera set up for the uh, PowerPoint. But, um, okay, what's your, what's your question? Well, I'm camera shy, so don't mind me. But um, I was just wanting to know, I know um, Volcan... Um, volcanic eruptions, they can cause earthquakes, correct? It, can they cause earthquakes as well because it, since the earth shifts around there as well, can it? Or am I mis, misinformed? No, and, and in fact that was one of the ways that, I, that uh, we talked about that can actually help predict right. a volcanic eruption. It's just a different type of earthquake. The, the typical kind of earthquakes that you read about in, in the newspaper are the result of plate motion where two plates are sliding and those are the ones the plates stick and then the energy gets released all it's like stretching a rubber band and having the rubber band snap but earthquakes an earthquake is really nothing more than vibrations in the earth so if i pound on this table the vibrations you feel is really a little earthquake so you, and so as the magma pushes to the surface it shakes the ground and makes hundreds of little earthquakes. So do you think with uh, global warming, let's say, for those people that believe in global warming that's happening, um, is it possible for, for volcanoes and earthquakes to come about as well with global warming happening? Because they say because of, since it's getting warmer, the glaciers are moving and it's water's moving this way and it's causing more volcanic eruptions, like the one we have in Hawaii, I think, that's, that's going off, I think. From the, yeah. From the I, I don't think there's, there's, a, there's a direct relationship between, be, be, between that, although what's interesting is in Yellowstone there were a lot of glaciers and sometimes as the glacial ice melts it can, it, it, it can really interact with those hot rocks, but, but I think those are really two different phenomena that we're talking about. Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs> can okay, I just thank you. I'm sorry. Okay, we have another uh, person that has a question. Okay, you have to come over this way because the time is going by very quickly. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Uh, why would be the uh, worst case scenario for uh, an eruption of a volcano that would uh, basically blanket the earth? Well, I, I think that the, the fear with a large volcanic eruption, like even the smaller volcanic eruptions that we've, that we've seen in, the, in uh, Krakatoa in the 1800s, even uh, Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago is when you put large amounts of, bulk of, of gas, water vapor, sulfur vapor, and then this fine ash clear up into the upper atmosphere. Sometimes those ash clouds can go tens of miles into the upper atmosphere, and then that would block the sunlight. 
And so if you have the blocking of sunlight could lead to cooler weathers, you know, whether that might lead to, you know, to, to even increase glaciation from a very large volcanic okay. eruption. We have to um, wrap this up because we've got about a minute left. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The time has flown by it's very... It's flown by very quickly. Very, very fast. Don't have any commercials either. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank Dr. Fritz for uh, being here today for your time and appreciation. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I, I enjoy being here very much, and I hope that uh, some of you on Staten Island will get a chance to go out to Yellowstone, and, and when you're there, really, really look at more than, than just the geysers and the hot springs, but really try to think about how volcanoes have, have really shaped the entire landscape around Yellowstone. The beautiful mountains, the valleys, is, is largely a, a result of, those, of us living on an active geologic planet. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Benamoff, thanks for uh, being here again. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fritz again for being on the show. I th mm -hmm. uh, it was fantastic. Okay. okay. That time went by so fast. Yes. Just like <laughs> geologic, you know, it's a little different. So uh, we will be doing more shows in the future, and maybe we'll do a part two. We can do a, we can do a part two. <laughs> okay. I think it's endless, the information. Thank the uh, volunteers for being here. And... Um, how much time we have? We're just about out of time. Chris, keep going. Yeah. We're wrapping up. Okay, <laughs> we'll see you next month. Next month. Bye-bye. <laughs>